This entire chapter is a series of contrasts between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant, between the teaching of Jesus and the, the hardness of people's hearts. The chapter begins, chapter 10, verses 1 through 12, is Jesus comparing how the Old Covenant viewed divorce and remarriage with how God designed divorce and remarriage. And the eternal majesty of marriage is laid forward by Jesus in contrast to the shallow and superficial way that people thought of marriage and how quick they were to embrace divorce. And then from there, we move to a second contrast in the middle of the chapter, verses 13 through 16. Jesus describes the material poverty of children, but their spiritual wealth. The whole army of children come to Jesus. They lack everything from the world's perspective, and yet they have the one thing that matters, faith. They, they Jesus describes, have the kingdom of heaven. While their pockets are empty, their hearts are full. And they provide the perfect contrast between the children and the rich young ruler who comes next, a wealthy, influential, powerful, political, religious figure. He comes with full pockets. He comes and seeks out Jesus. He lacks nothing materially, but he lacks everything spiritually. He's the opposite case of the children. And when he comes to Jesus, he has one question for Jesus. What does it take to be Saved, And of course, Jesus tells him, he challenges him to surrender his life to the Messiah, to sell all he has, give to the poor, and follow Jesus Christ. And this ruler, of course, was not interested in doing that. And last week, he looked at how Jesus laid out the challenge in such a way that it, it pulled back the curtain of this ruler's heart. It showed that in his heart, he loved the world, not our Lord Jesus we saw that Jesus wasn't interested in making superficial converts. He didn't lead the man in the sinner's prayer. He didn't tell him, you know, close your eyes and repeat after me and really, really mean it and you're saved. He didn't break out the four spiritual laws or three spiritual rules or two facts you should know or one way uh, to glory. He didn't go in through any kind of system. He didn't argue the man. He didn't break the man. He didn't manipulate the man into making a momentary decision for Jesus. Instead, Jesus showed that true evangelism is showing the person the reality of his heart and confronting him with the exclusive claims of Jesus Christ. Jesus brought this point, this man to the point where he could choose to love the world or to love the Savior. But after his conversation with Jesus, he couldn't go forward trying to do both. Jesus wasn't interested in accumulating some superficial decisions. He didn't want a handful of followers. He didn't want to grow his number of followers. He wasn't concerned about the amount of people who were following him. He was concerned about the sincerity of their heart. He wanted true converts, not just people to follow him. This was a man who respected Jesus, who admired Jesus, who was admired by others. He came to Jesus and asked Jesus the right question, and he went away sad and empty. And from that passage last week, we learned this lesson, that salvation means changing your love. Salvation means changing your heart. It means loving new things. It means having your affections changed. It means going from living for yourself to living for Jesus. Salvation, the essence of salvation, is turning from the way you've always lived your life and surrendering your life to Jesus Christ. As I said, Jesus wasn't after people who wanted to make a half-hearted decision to follow him. He wasn't after getting people to make a, a, a momentary commitment that might last for three minutes or three hours or three days or three weeks or three years or three decades only to then be confronted with the cost of discipleship. For Jesus, he laid out the cost at the beginning and, and he demanded that people turn from their sins, surrender authority in their life to him, to sell what they have and follow him, in other words. That's how he put it to the, the ruler. And of course, that is impossible to do. It's impossible for a person to turn from every way they've always lived their life. I mean, even more so when his call is to follow somebody who's going to go be crucified. In this context here, he keeps teaching on his crucifixion. He's taught on it twice so far. In the very next passage for next week, he's teaching on it again. Everybody knows that he's going to be crucified. He says it over and over and over again. They don't, under, they don't understand what it means, but they don't have any ambiguity about what's about to happen. He knows that he is going to be crucified. Everybody who's following him has been confronted with that news over and over and over again. So how, from a person's perspective, are you supposed to surrender everything in this life to walk away from all of your wealth and to just lay it all down and follow somebody who you know is going to be murdered? How are you supposed to do that? Well, with man, Jesus says, it is impossible. It's impossible. 
Look at the language Jesus uses to describe salvation. To be his follower, he says, you have to count the cost. You must pick up your cross and follow him, which is another language to march to your own death. Surrender your life, put on the instrument of death on your back and carry it until the point you're finally murdered for the person whom you follow. You must deny your life, he says. Elsewhere, he says, you must forfeit your life. You must surrender your life. You must become like a child, he says earlier in Mark 10, become like a child. In John 3, he says, you must be born again. What does that even mean? I mean, Nicodemus is stunned by that and says, how can you be born again? How can a person do that? And the answer, you can't. I'm often confronted with people who say, you know, this list of things, denying yourself and picking up your cross and surrendering your life, I mean, you can't say you have to do that in order to be saved because nobody can do that. My response is, aha, exactly nobody can do that. You may as well find a camel and try to shove him through the eye of a needle if you think you can do that. With man, Jesus says, it is impossible. You can't perform heart surgery on yourself. You can't save yourself. You can't change your own affections. You cannot do this. It's a work of God on your heart. That's the point. But that sets up this wonderful contrast between this ruler who went away materially rich and spiritually bankrupt. He walks away unwilling to relinquish control of his life. He won't do it. And then the camera kind of zooms in on the 12. There they are. They're standing there. Well, guess what? They've done that. It's impossible to do, but God worked on their heart and they did it. Jesus told Matthew to leave your, your, your tax collecting table and, and he did. Jesus told Peter and Andrew, drop your nets and they dropped them. They followed him and he made them fishers of men. They have left everything. And just in case you've forgotten that point, one of the 12 is humble enough to remind us of it. You can guess which one that is. Verse 28, Peter, of course, began to say to him, and you, you, I like the way Mark puts it, began to say, like he's working up his speech here. Began to say to him, behold, summoning everybody's attention, behold, we have left everything to follow you. Peter's boldness matched only by his humility. We've left it all, Lord. What of us? Now, the truth is, they have left it all. They did. This change happened in their heart. They dropped their nets. They walked away from their tax table. They've left Galilee. They're on the road to Jerusalem. When the whole world has rejected Jesus, there they are following him. The dusty trail north of Galilee earlier when Jesus returned back to Israel and he was rejected for the final time by the, the Jews back there in Galilee and he left. The only people who were there were the 12. Even before his exile out of Israel, John 6 lets us know that the whole crowd left him and Jesus looked at the 12 and said, are you gonna leave too? And they said, no, where else would we go? They have left everything. Of course, Judas hasn't. I mean, his feet are following Jesus, but his heart still clutches love of the world in it. But the other 11 don't know that. They don't know the wickedness of his heart. They don't know that he has not sold all he has to follow Jesus. They don't know that he hasn't surrendered his life and he's still holding on to it. But the other 11 have. And so when Peter says, we have done this, he's speaking the truth. And this presents just this amazing, monumental, radical, comprehensive contrast between the ruler who went away spiritually bankrupt and the 12 who have laid down everything to follow Jesus. Look at Jesus' response. Truly, I say in verse 29, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sister or mother or father or children or farms for my sake and for the gospel's sake, but that he will receive a hundred times as much now in the present age houses and brothers, sisters and mothers and children and farms along with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last first. This lets us know that not only does salvation require a change in your affections and your love, salvation also requires a change in your family. When you come to faith in Christ, you don't just get a new heart, you get a new family a new family. Peter's question or statement, 
provides the perfect opportunity for Jesus to explain the radical nature of his relationship to the family. If you were to search the New Testament for what is the most outrageous or radical is the word I keep using, statement that Jesus makes, this would certainly have to be one of the contenders. The most central human institution of all, the family, Jesus upends here and says that he takes preeminence over it. As I said, this whole chapter is a series of contrasts between the, the shallow view of people and the majestic view of, of God through the gospel. But it's also a contrast between the way the old covenant was structured and the way the new covenant is structured. For example, in the old covenant, in the beginning of Mark 10, Moses permitted divorce. But Jesus says that's only for your hardness of heart. The old covenant was entered in by physical birth, not the new covenant. It's entered in by spiritual birth. In the old covenant, children were of primary importance. In the old covenant, if you didn't have physical offspring, you were considered cursed by God. The Jews had the, the idea of physical descendants. It was so integral to their understanding of the way God was working in the world. Every Israelite was able to trace his family lineage back to his family when they went through the exodus. Joshua divided up the lands by families. All of the Jews knew that your family was your, your means to your land, your inheritance, everything hinged on your family. You needed to have descendants. The Jews had this attitude. If you couldn't produce descendants, if you couldn't have children, you were saying to all of your ancestors, everybody who'd gone before you, that they may as well have died in the wilderness because you don't even have the decency to pass along their land to your family. This is why in the Old Testament, if you were unable to have children in your marriage, it was common to have a divorce. Nobody would say you couldn't get a divorce if you couldn't have children. Nobody would be that callous or cold-hearted to say, well, if, you're, if there's infertility or barrenness, you just, you're just stuck with that. That's your lock in, lot in life. Nobody would say that. In fact, one of the reasons for polygamy that was so common in the Old Testament was precisely that reason, to almost guarantee that you would have a way to pass down your family line. It's axiomatic in the Old Testament that if you're blessed by God, you have children. If you're cursed by God, you don't. And you see that with woman after woman in the Old Testament who's, it says the Lord closed her, her womb and they're crying out to God. They're wondering, why, what did I do to be rejected by God like this? I mean, it's so much so that in the Old Testament law, if a couple was married and the husband died and left a brother, the brother was required to provide physical descendants for his deceased husband to pass down the family line. I mean, that's so twisted by our standards. By our world, that's, that's grotesque. But in their world, it was an act of love. It was an act of kindness that you had to do it because that's how important physical offspring were. Well, things are changing in the new covenant. Jesus sets all that aside in the new covenant. You get a little inkling of that because in the new covenant, here comes Jesus who is supremely blessed by God and guess what? He's single. He has no children. He doesn't have physical ancestors or physical descendants. He is single without any physical children at all and yet he's supremely blessed by God. This is even alluded to in the, the Old Testament, Isaiah 53 in the suffering servant song that describes it pleased Yahweh to, to bruise him, to crush him, that God laid upon the iniquities of all in the Messiah. He was bruised for our transgressions, afflicted for our iniquities. And yet that glorious suffering servant passage says, yet he will see his descendants. He will see his offspring. How did Jesus see his descendants? How did Jesus see his offspring? He died single. He didn't have any children. What offspring did he have? Well, Jesus is reorienting all of family around himself. It all is turned on its head. In the Old Testament, it was of primary importance to have physical children. In the New Testament, that's set aside. It's set aside. And this has already been hinted at earlier in Jesus' ministry. For example, in Luke 14, 26, Jesus says this, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. In the Jewish mind, this love-hatred contrast, they didn't mean the same thing we mean by it. Like in our minds, love and hate are these two powerful, all-surpassing emotions. You even tell your children, you can't say the word hate. In the Jewish mindset, they use the word differently. If there was ever a choice, you choose one and not the other. The one you choose is what you love. The one you don't choose is what you hate. I mean, they use this in the marketplace. If there's a rack of apples and you choose one, you love this one and you hate the others. 
That's what Jesus means here. Whoever wants to follow Jesus as the Messiah must love him and hate his family. That Jesus requires supreme devotion above even the most intricate and intimate of the human relationships, the family. The family is God's design by common grace, given to the whole world to make the world lovable and, and livable and enjoyable. And yet Jesus requires devotion above that. He doesn't set aside the fifth commandment. He doesn't say don't honor your father and your mother. He supersedes it. He claims greatness. He says that he is greater than the fifth commandment. Honor your father and your mother. But if there's a fork in the road and you're forced to choose loyalty to your family or loyalty to the Messiah, you can't even pretend to be a follower of Jesus Christ unless you say your, your lot is with the Messiah, that you are all in with him. You're not worth it to be his disciple if you can't say that. That's the teaching of Luke 14, 26. In other words, loyalty to family is less than your loyalty to the Messiah. And that also makes sense because earlier before even that, in Luke 12, Jesus said this, do you suppose that I came to grant peace on earth? And that's a very rhetorical question. We should pause there. Do you suppose that I came to bring peace on earth? How would you answer that question? Notice the way that Jesus even phrases it here. Are you naive enough to think that he came to bring peace on earth? Not so, he says, Luke 12, 51. I tell you, no, but rather division. For from now on, five members in one household will be divided. Three against two, two against three. They'll be divided. Father against son, son against father. Mother against daughter, daughter against mother. Mother-in-law against daughter-in-law, daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. This is the sort of division that Jesus brings to the family because he demands your heart, he demands your affections, your loyalty. You cannot follow Jesus while still having ultimate loyalty, loyalty to your family. You're either in or you're out. You can't serve two masters. You might be able to pull it off for a while, but at some point you're gonna have to choose. And Jesus always lays it out at the beginning. For that reason, he brings division. And this is strange in, in our culture because I think many of us in the church, in this church, come from Christian families that you love the Lord because your parents love the Lord. And so there was been no sort of division in your family. Your family has always valued Jesus Christ. And that's a, a healthy, happy family. You know, when the father loves Jesus more than he loves the mother and the mother loves Jesus more than she loves the father, that brings peace and unity to the family right there. When the people in the family love Jesus Christ more than they love themselves, then the family's not divided for the gospel. But in the gospel, for many families in the world, and for this first generation of believers, every family, they are forced then to choose between their loyalty to Jesus or their loyalty to each other. And this is why Jesus says that he brings a sword. He brings it to the families. He separates this reminds me of Christian in the Pilgrim's Progress. You remember the story in the great Puritan allegory that the Christian, this fictional character named Christian to represent every person who follows the Lord comes to faith in Christ and he sees the light, the eternal light on the horizon, the narrow wicker gate that the prophet tells him to go to. And so he starts out of the city heading towards the wicker gate. And on his way, his wife sees that he's setting off. His children see that he's going. And they come running out of their house. They grab his legs. They grab his shirt. They're holding on to him and they're begging him not to go. This is how it's described in, in the book. Now, he had not run far from his own door, but his wife and children, perceiving it, begin to cry after him to return. But the man Christian put his fingers in his ears and ran on crying, life, life, eternal life. So he looked not behind him, but fled towards the middle of the plain. This is the point in Mark 10. That there will be those who in order to follow Jesus will have to separate from their family. That's how Jesus says it. You will leave your father, your sisters, your mother, your brothers, your children for the sake of the gospel. But he says, and this is such a critical contrast here, but nobody will leave those things and not receive a hundred times more. Not a hundred percent more. A hundred times more, a thousand percent more. This is rewards by God that are disproportionate to our sacrifice. You leave one family member, you receive hundreds more in the church. 
You leave one temptation of the world, one joy you have to set aside for the sake of the gospel, you receive blessings that are a thousand percent greater than that. And that is just like God to bless us with his grace wildly and disproportionately beyond our sacrifice. This is the way God works. You leave a little, you get more. You leave a lot, you get exponentially more. This is the grace of the gospel. Well, what does that mean? How do you leave your family for the gospel and receive hundreds more in exchange? We get a hint from earlier in Mark 3. Earlier in Mark 3, Jesus was preaching. And do you remember his mother and his brothers and sisters came out to arrest him? The Greek word is is seize him. They wanted to shut him down. They wanted to bring him back in. They thought he was making a fool of himself. They said he was out of his mind. They opposed his gospel preaching. And the crowd said, your mother, this is Mark 3, 33, I think, your mother is outside looking for you, wanting to seize you. Do you remember what Jesus said? Who is my mother and my brother? Who are they? Then he says, whoever does the will of God, that is my mother. That is my brother. That is my sister. In saying that, Jesus launches a new family dynamic, a new relationship. That it's a family based on those who do the will of God. This isn't a family you enter by obedience. What that means to do the will of God. The will of God is to believe in the son whom he sent. Jesus says that over and over and over again. It's a family you enter through by believing in the gospel. When you give your life to to Christ, you become part of this new family. That's the point. In Christ, there's a new reality, a new family. And this shows how radical Jesus' teaching is. That he's turning the whole world order on its head. That in the church... You have a new family that is superior, more precious to your physical family. Jesus puts allegiance to the spiritual family above allegiance to the physical family. And listen, it's not that physical families have no value at all. That's not his point. But it's that every relationship in a physical family is a picture of a spiritual truth. The father relationship to his children, the mother's relationship to her children, brothers and sisters relationship to each other. Those are all pictures of a spiritual reality. And that spiritual reality is alive and well inside of the church. This is why even in Mark 10 earlier, Jesus says, nobody can come to salvation unless they come like a child. When you enter into salvation relationship with Jesus Christ, you come like a child. Mark 10, 15. Jesus began blessing them and laying his hands on them. He says, truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child will not enter it at all. Listen, we all understand that we're children of God. When you put your faith in Jesus Christ, you become a child of God. The physical relationship of a father to his children is manifest in the church in a real, transcendent, and eternal way as you become a child of God. But the analogy is not limited just to the relationship between believers and God. The analogy is played out in every relationship in the church. When you lead someone to Christ, you become their spiritual father. This is how Paul says it in 1 Corinthians 4.15. For though you have countless guides in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For I became your father in Christ Jesus through the gospel, he says. 1 Corinthians 4.15. He says, I became your father through the gospel. He's telling the whole church that. He established that church and he's letting them know, I am your spiritual father through the gospel. Listen, Paul was single. He had no physical children that we know of. In the Old Testament, he would have been cursed. In the New Testament, he is supremely blessed because of the people who have come to faith under his ministry. In fact, Paul takes the analogy even farther than we're probably comfortable doing in Galatians 4.19. He says, my dear children, I'm again suffering in labor pains until Christ is formed in you. Paul describes himself as a mother in birth pains through his evangelism to these Galatians. He's laboring over them until they finally come to faith in Christ and have the Holy Spirit in their hearts. Until then, he's laboring over them, trying to bring them into spiritual life. This is why Paul can tell Timothy in 1 Timothy 1, 2, to Timothy, my true son in the faith. Timothy becomes Paul's real transcendent son. This explains the bond between Paul and Timothy. 
Beyond that, Paul says this is not limited to Timothy. Philemon, verse 10, Paul says, I appeal to you for my own son Onesimus, whom I fathered while I was in chains. Onesimus, if you remember the story, was a runaway slave. He ran away, he fled, he got thrown in prison because he was a runaway slave. He fell into the wrong crowd in prison. He met an evangelist. (laughs) And he comes to faith in Christ. So that Paul then describes Onesimus as his son whom he fathered while he was in chains. This special relationship with Onesimus. And this is not limited to only Paul either. Peter himself, 1 Peter 5.13, describes John Mark, the author of the very gospel we're reading, as Mark, my son. And this is not just an upward relationship either. It's not, listen, the person who led you to faith in Christ is your spiritual father or your spiritual mother. But beyond that, this relationship is horizontal. To your brothers and sisters in the church, this is why in 1 Timothy 5, Paul tells you, treat older women as mothers and younger women as sisters, 1 Timothy 5, 2. An older and more mature woman in the church is your spiritual mother. Other ladies in the church around your age are your spiritual sisters. I mean, there's this temptation. If you come to faith in Christ and your family does not, you can feel cheated, you can feel slighted. And that's a common reality even in the D.C. area, especially with a lot of the the immigrant families. People who are first-generation believers, when they put their faith in Christ, the ties are cut. You know, they're not coming to weddings anymore. They're not coming over for holidays anymore. It's done. They've been put out. They're done. And they can feel so cheated by God, so slighted by God. All they did was believe the gospel. And look, their whole family dynamic is unraveled. But the point here is that they shouldn't feel isolated because in the church, they get hundreds of more family members. Sometimes people who are single for the cause of Christ feel cheated or slighted. In the Old Testament, singleness was a curse, really, with a few exceptions. In the New Testament, Jesus esteems it. In Matthew 19, he talks about those who remain single for the cause of the gospel. And he says that they're blessed by God. Or in 1 Corinthians 7, Paul says he wishes everybody were single as he was for the advancement of the gospel's sake because his interests aren't divided. He can go to dangerous places. He can lay his life down on the gospel without hesitating because of concern for his family. He can do that. He wishes every believer could do that. Do you see how in the New Testament, singleness is exalted? Listen, single people have zero disadvantage in the new covenant when it comes to bearing children for God. In fact, they have an advantage. They have an advantage. This is the new spiritual reality that Jesus creates. That relationship with him is more precious than with your own physical family. Hey, sometimes you'll come to faith in Christ. They were married as both unbelievers. They come to faith in Christ and their spouse leaves. Their spouse is so angry about your conversion, they jet. And you feel robbed by God. You say, my life was good and my marriage was solid until I came to faith in Christ. And now I'm divorced and I'm abandoned. This is what the gospel did for me. It wrecked it. But no, don't let the root of bitterness grow up in your heart. Because in the church, you have relationships that are more precious than that. If you're a missionary, maybe you move across the country or across the world, leaving your family behind. And this is a foreign concept for us now because we live in a world with 747s and, you know, furloughs, missionary furloughs. You know, missionaries come home every year, every few years. You know, for thousands of years of church history, it was not that way. That when missionaries went into the mission field, they said bye to their life, bye to their world. Be back in 40 years, maybe. They set their boats ablaze, to use Coronado's language. They're done, and they go off across the ocean. And it's so tempting to let a brood of bitterness grow up in their hearts. And Jesus says, you can't let that happen because everybody who leaves Their family leaves the world for the sake of the gospel. We'll get so much more. So much more. And the truth is those new relationships are more permanent and more precious than relationships in the family. Because they're spiritual. They're eternal. The family is so temporary. It's a physical picture for a short period of time. And yet the spiritual relationships are eternal. And for some people, this is a a dichotomy that you don't understand. If you're from a family where everybody is a believer, there's no dichotomy here, right? (laughs) 
It's not that those in the church are more precious than your family. If your family are believers, they're in the church also. You're doubly blessed. If you're sitting here and your parents are Christians, I'm not saying that your Christian parents are less to be valued than the people you know in the church. That's ridiculous. (laughs) Because your Christian parents are part of the church. You're doubly blessed. But understand that for most believers in the world, that's not the reality. For most believers in the world, the sword has been brought to the family. And they're forced to reckon with it. Even in case for missionaries, for example, Romans 16, Paul says this, Greet Rufus, Romans 16, 13, chosen in the Lord, also his mother, who's been a mother to me as well, Romans 16, 13. Paul says in, in that passage, he left Jerusalem for Rome. There's no flights back and forth. When he left Jerusalem, for this point, he's not coming back. He ends up in jail even in Rome. And as he writes them later, there was this woman in the church there who acted as his mother. Who acted as his mother because he was away from home. This has been exactly my experience here at Emmanuel. My parents don't live in the D.C. area. I have parents, but they don't live here. My wife has parents, but they don't live here. My kids have grandparents, but they don't live here. And yet there's so many people in the church that act like a mother to me. I mean that in a good way. There's so many people in the church that act like grandparents to to my children. That's the blessing of being in the church. And it's not limited to this one physical geographical location. This is true about every church in the world. You have brothers and sisters in Christ all around the world that you'll never meet in this life, but that's what heaven is for. Imagine the joy you have of a family reunion. Well, think of eternity as that sense, that you meet your brothers and your sisters in the Lord, that you can spend eternity with them. This is why spiritual relationships are so much more precious than those that are simply physical. You know, there's no marriage in heaven. You understand that, right? Marriage is for this age. It's a picture of a spiritual reality, and the reality is there in heaven. But listen, if your spouse is a believer, you'll know them in heaven and you'll have a special relationship with them in heaven. It's, in fact, it's almost magnified. You're not married to them in heaven, but you have a special spiritual relationship with them. You can't be disappointed about that. I mean, understand that heaven is better than you think it is. So often our temptation is to say, oh, I wish heaven would be more like this. I'm going to kind of be disappointed in the way that it will be. Now, are you kidding me? It's better than you think it is. If your spouse is a believer, you're going to have an incredibly precious and spiritual and better relationship with them in glory. That's the truth. And that's played out on the church in this stage right here in this world. Relationships based on family are temporary. Relationships based on union with Christ are eternal. Because they're a picture of Christ who is eternal. Well, not only does Jesus radically reorient our families around himself by placing himself in our family, the center of our family relationships, but also he changes your possessions. When you come to faith in Christ, you change your love, you change your family, and you change your possessions as well. Your wealth, your land, your houses, your farms, your, your barns, Jesus says here. You're setting your authority over that aside also. You know, when you're outside of Christ, you're in charge of your stuff. <laughs> You're the master of your own ship. You can spend your money on whatever you want to spend it on. You're in charge. Go for it. But when you come to faith in Christ, you surrender authority over your own stuff. You realize that you're not the master of your life. You're you're a slave. You're a steward. Everything you have belongs to God. You're keeping watch over it. And you will give an account for how you use it. That's the point here. You, You walk away as the rich young ruler was unwilling to do. You relinquish authority and control over your stuff. That doesn't mean, by the way, that you sell all you have and you write a check and everybody brings it next Sunday and lays their check down, liquidate everything and pile up all our cash here next Sunday. Well, that's crazy. Because what would we do the next week? (laughs) We'd all be poor. Week two, we're all done. (laughs) Of course, that's not what it means. It's played out in the church. You're a steward of your, your stuff. If you have wealth, you invest your wealth, you multiply your wealth, you grow your wealth. The whole time you're giving it away, you're meeting needs in the church. You see that in the book of Acts. They sold what they had to meet each other's needs, not to, not to wipe out poverty in the world, but to meet the needs in the church. You're not giving your wealth over to the control of the church. Peter makes that clear in Acts 5, remember? With Ananias and Sapphira, he says, you didn't need to do this. It was yours. It was under your control. You're a steward of it. 
If you have wealth and you're a believer, you use that wealth, you invest it, you grow it, you multiply it, you increase your riches so that you have more to give away. And the whole time you're giving it away to those in the church to meet needs, to advance the gospel. Notice how Jesus says it. For my sake, meaning as it relates to salvation, and for the gospel's sake, meaning as it relates to the Great Commission, that missionaries go around the world and they're funded by money that you give. That's how the gospel is advanced. And you are a steward over it. You use your riches to gain for yourself friends and relatives in heaven. You relinquish authority over your life. That's the idea here. It's the same thing he told the rich young ruler. One thing you lack. It's one thing. Sell you have, give to the poor, and here's the one thing. Follow me. Again, it's absurd to think literally sell you have and give all to the poor on that moment. Although that's what he told the rich young ruler to do, which exposes the sin in his heart. The point of it is you relinquish control of your life. That's the one thing. That's the one thing. Why would you do that? Why would somebody go from living for themselves and using all their wealth to amass more wealth just so they can pass it down to their family? Why would they go from that to surrendering control of all of their stuff for the advancement of the gospel? Why would you do that? Because you love Jesus more than your stuff. Because you have a new family. You have a new heart, a new love for the sake of me, for the sake of the gospel. In that sense, every Christian is a missionary. You're all sent by God on a mission to the world. You're all using your wealth to advance the gospel throughout the world. (laughs) But then Jesus tacks on one more thing to his list. In the church, you get a new family. You get new possessions. But guess guess what else you get? Persecutions, he says. Well, that's a fine thing to throw on that list, isn't it? (laughs) Hundreds more family. Hundreds times more possessions. Oh, in verse 30, along with persecutions. How does that fit into this list? Because persecutions are like your birth certificate into the family of God. They're proof. They're the DNA test that proves that you're one of God's children. When the world opposes you because they oppose God, that's evidence of your heritage. That's evidence of your spiritual family. They oppose Jesus, they'll oppose you as well. That's the point of that. But many who are first will be last and the last will be first. You experience all of these difficulties in this age, but in the age to come, Jesus says in verse 30, you will have eternal life. You don't make any sacrifices in this life that you won't be more than blessed for in this life, but that's almost not even the point. If it was just for this life only, as far as possessions go, <laughs> Jesus is saying, look, you get more in this life anyway, but it's not just for this life. The point is that in the life to come, you gain eternal life. When everything that's valued in this world is turned on its head, the last will be first, the first will be last, is a profound statement. And we'll look at that statement next week.